So as I said last time, the introductory part of the course is over. And we start now in real earnest to solve real problems. And we'll learn how to write computer programs to solve real problems. Initially, we are going to concentrate on solving numerical problems. But subsequently, we'll extend ourselves to handle problems involving strings, involving large number of values, and ultimately will relate to what we call large databases and files. In today's lecture, we'll review the CPP Dumbo, or essentially C++ programs, how they are written. More specifically, we'll look at iterative numerical computations. We had done this kind of thing in the last lecture. We'll do a review quickly of the basic commands when we look at the C++ program structure, including iterations and conditional execution. But we'll immediately get into solving numerical problems of the type, finding out factorial of a number. We'll introduce what we would like to call Hemchandra numbers. There is a more famous name associated with it. We'll see that. And we'll conclude today's lecture with an example of finding roots of an equation using newton raphson method. At the end, I'll very briefly describe the course and lab organization, specifically relating to lab structure now onwards, as well as the evaluation approach that we shall use in this course. So first, the C++ program structure. I always start with hash include IO stream. I always write using namespace std. Then I say int main opening bracket, closing bracket, and an opening brass. This is followed by the statements of our algorithm or statements of our program, instructions or statements. And after we complete all instructions, we shall write return 0 followed by a closing brass. This is the structure of any C++ program that you would have to write. We have hinted at the meaning of some of these lines. But for the time being, we shall consider all of these lines to be mandatory to be written in our program. Let's assume that our C++ Dumbo cannot understand that we are giving him a program unless we write it in this structure. Of course, whatever instructions we actually want to give C++ to do our computations will be contained inside this block, as I have indicated. Any set of statements enclosed with an opening brass and completed with a closing brass is called a block. We shall see many such blocks inserted within themselves and so on in the subsequent uh, uh, slides. So is this clear to everybody? This is how a C++ program structure will look like. And we shall explain as the course goes on the meaning of different lines here. We discussed in the introductory lectures last week some of the C++ data types. So we have seen, for example, that our Dumbo can handle numerical values and string data. We have seen that as far as we are concerned, both within our programs and while giving input to Dumbo or while collecting output from Dumbo, we shall write or see values of this form, 7.45, 12.3 e minus 12, which effectively stands 12.3 into 10 to the power minus 12. I hope you will recall that this number will be stored internally in a floating point format with the mantissa as just 0.123 equivalent and the exponent appropriately adjusted. We can have strings like this. This is a special string which denotes end of life. There is a special symbol, in fact, which we shall see in some of our programs. So constant values are written like this by us, but C++ stores these values in an internal format. Much later in the course, when we shall discuss the internal intricacies of the actual computer, when we shall see the hardware, we shall have an occasion to look at the binary representation of all numbers or all characters that we actually deal with. And then we shall know more as to what are the problems and nuances with such internal representation. However, for the time being, we shall take it 
that C++ can handle decimal values in these forms and character strings in this form. The numerical values always have an associated type. So if you look at, look at the Dumbo's programming model, he has drawers for memory locations and each drawer contains a value. Each drawer has a name which is called a variable name. Not only that, each drawer must have an associated type of value which the drawer can contain. So you have to correspondingly declare the data type associated with every variable name. These data types for numerical values could be int, long, float, or double. You will recall that in the last lecture we had looked at these data types and seen what kind of values can be stored and handled. And as I said, since you have to define variables initially in your program, you will have statements of the type int count, which means count is a variable name which will store only integer values, float a, b, sum. So these three variable names will be able to store only floating point values, double large value. These are some of the data types that we associate with our variables. The C++ statements which will form the body of our computer program will contain more than one instructions. Each instruction of our program can ordinarily convey any one of the three actions which will be executed by Dumbo when Dumbo executes our program. These three actions could be assignment, which is the most important computational instruction, because that is how we'll do computations, input and output. We have seen examples of all of these. For example, assignment examples, sum equal to A plus B, semicolon. Each instruction is to be terminated by a semicolon for C++. Area is equal to X minus 1 star 1 upon X minus 1. You will recall this kind of expression. This expression has a precedence depending upon which operators come one after another. We had discussed the precedence. In case of any doubt or whenever you require to override the natural precedence of operators in the evaluation of expressions, you shall use brackets. Opening and closing brackets will have the highest precedence. So within this opening bracket and closing bracket, for example, this x minus 1 will be evaluated completely and the resultant value will be used for multiplying whatever comes next. There's a peculiar type of assignment which we looked at where, for example, we may say m is equal to m plus x divided by 2.5. m appears on both sides. We noted specifically that this is not an equation in a conventional sense, but this is rather a reassignment. So there exists a value of m to begin with. That value is added to x divided by 2.5, and whatever is the resultant value is reassigned to m. So m loses its old value, and from now onwards in our program, it will take the new value. As we have seen in the iterative loops, this is an extremely useful tool with us, the reassignment. A special form of reassignment is increment. For example, we want to change the value of some count by one. We can write count equal to count plus one, semicolon. This is an instruction where Dumbo looks at the value of count in the drawer. Whatever the value is, 25, 37, it will simply add one to it and put it back. So it will become 26 or 38 appropriate. This can be abbreviated in a format of this type, count plus equal one. So plus equal always means that on the right hand side, whatever is the value, and this could be a complex expression as well, that has to be added to the existing value of count and the resultant value has to be deposited back in that variable. A still shorter mechanism to represent exactly the same thing is to say plus plus count or count plus plus. We shall see the usage of these things more within the for loops and such things where this is not part of an expression but this is a standalone expression itself. So whenever we say count plus plus, in fact count plus plus is, is a full-fledged expression whose value at the end of execution is the previous value plus one. So this is the increment and in general the assignment statements is how it is handled. As far as input is concerned, input is handled using the C in directive where we separate out different values to be obtained from us by C++ using greater greater symbols. So C in greater greater x, greater greater max value means uh, C++ uh, C++ Dumbo is looking at getting two input values. 
the first one that we'll give will be associated with x, the next one will be associated with max y. In exactly the same fashion, an output instruction can be given to C++ using C out. C out less less something, less less something, less less something, etc. is the format in which if we have a string, the string will be printed verbatim on our screen. If we have a variable name or an expression, then the value of that variable or the value of the resultant expression after computation will be put out. This is a spacious string as I have explained. At the end of any output statement, you should include this because this will go to the new line so that if you have multiple C out instructions in the same program, the output will not appear cluttered. It will appear separated on different lines. Next, we discussed in the last class conditional execution, where program instructions are normally executed by C++ in the given sequence. First, second, third, fourth, even if you have 10,000 instructions, they will all be executed in the given sequence. You remember we said that is the beauty of computers. They are a stored program machine. That means I can write a program ahead of time, give the entire set to the computer, which will store my program and will religiously execute instructions in the given sequence. However, there are occasions when we do not want C++ or for that matter any other programming language which the computer uses to execute instructions in the given sequence. We might conditionally want to go out of sequence and do something else. For such purposes, C++ is endowed with a conditional execution capability. C++ can examine conditions and based on the result, condition is, is A greater than B. Is your name equal to this? Is your hostel number safe? This, of eight, or whatever. So when you ask such questions, the answer is always yes or no. If the answer is yes, you would like to do something. If the answer is no, you would like to do something else. That is the most natural conditional evaluation or conditional execution of statements you would like to do. Whenever we say yes or no, in computer terminology, we call these as the result of condition, condition evaluation and the result is always represented as true or false. True and false are logical values which represent yes and no for our answer. So the way we instruct Mr. Dumbo is to say if in bracket a condition and remember last time we examined the different kind of conditions that we can write using less than, less than equal to, greater than, greater than equal to, not equal to, etc, etc. And we also saw that the conditions could be fairly complex. We could have any complicated expression inside as long as there is a comparison and the ultimate result cannot be a numerical value generally it will be a logical value either yes or no the answer must be yes if the answer is yes then the statements in group number one are executed else the statements in group number two are executed if you have no else clause if you simply want to execute some statements if the condition is true otherwise simply carry on you can simply terminate this statement at this point. You need not write else. Here is an example. Based on the age of a passenger, let's say the bus ticket cost is different. Suppose it is 25 rupees 50 paise for an adult, but for children there is a concession, 50% concession, so children can travel at 12 rupees 50 paise or 12 rupees 75 paise. Now suppose I write these statements. I get in age, the value of age is inside the computer. Now I say ticket equal to 12.75, then I say ticket equal to 25.50, and then output saying rupees so much. End L, by the way, is a special name which represents backslash N or new line. This special name is not to be used for any other purpose. You should avoid using a variable with this name. Actually, this name belongs to what we call the global namespace or standard namespace which our Dumbo uses. So C++ has predefined names and these names are understood whenever he is using a namespace, hypothetical namespace where all such names are put together and C++ is aware of them. This will explain to you the use of one sentence at the beginning of a program using namespace, namespace STD. So when you say using namespace STD, we are telling Dumbo that the variables that I shall use, I will define. However, I know that you have a large repertoire of library names and so many other things. Please use that standard library to define all these names. Anyway, so what will this do? What will this program print? 
it will print 25.50 because instructions are executed in the given sequence. Suppose I don't like it and I invert that sequence. So I say ticket equal to 25.50 first and then say ticket equal to 12.75. Now, independent of age, Dumbo will print 12.75. So you see the assignment to variable ticket will always be the last assigned value irrespective of age. And that is what will get printed. Does this solve our problem? No. We want to print the right value of the ticket depending upon the age of the person. And this is where we require to deviate from the conventional serial execution of our instruction. And that's the reason why we'll use the if statement. Here is what we wish to do actually. I am following this path. I have executed some instruction which is C in or something. I get the value of age. I want to examine whether age is greater than 12. If the answer is yes, or the condition is true, I want to make an assignment ticket equal to 25.5. If the answer is no, on the other hand, there can be only two possible answers. So true or false. Then I want to execute this instruction which says ticket equal to 12.75 and get out. To indicate this kind of execution capabilities, I shall use the if statement which we just introduced. So we shall say, after we get the age, if age is greater than 12, ticket is equal to 25.50, uh, else ticket is 12.75. Please note that either this or this will be executed. Although both of them are written one after another, the natural sequence is completely ignored because we have given an if statement here. So as a result, when I come out of this if block, as we call it, at this point, the value of the ticket will be appropriately set depending upon age. And when I print this ticket, I will get the correct value. Consider an additional squiggle. We have considered only if age is more than 12, an adult will cost this much. If the, uh, there is a child, the ticket will cost so much. But suppose there are elder citizens, like I'm a senior citizen beyond 60 years, and suppose I am charged only 20 rupees. Then given the same value of age, in the same program, I should be able to discern between elders, then uh, uh, that is senior citizens, adults, and children. For that, I can use what is known as an if-else-if ladder. This ladder is like steps. So for example, here I get in the age and check if age is greater than 60. If it is, I set ticket equal to 20 rupees. If it is not, then automatically it means that age is either less than or equal to 60. So when I come to the next statement, else-if, notice that I will come to this else-if only if age is not greater than 60. So when I come here, I can examine if age is greater than 12. If it is, then I will set ticket equal to 25.5. Else, I know the age is less than or equal to 12, and the value of the ticket should be 12.75. Are you clear about this? So there is a series, and I could write if, else if, else if, else if, as many times as I want. That is why it is called a ladder. Notice, however, that you have to be extremely careful in the order of examining these conditions. For example, will it do to put this condition, age greater than 12 at the top and age greater than 60 here? Yes or no? No. Because if I put age greater than 12 here, then I will get 25.50 assigned first. If age is greater than 60, I will get correct age assigned, and then else, if none of them are true, I will assign this. So what is wrong? If age is less than 60, okay, I will leave it to you. Please go ahead and execute that these three conditions, in this sequence they seem to work. You all seem to believe that if I change the sequence of condition checking, then the result will not be correct. Please examine all possible combinations and find out whether there exists at least one other sequence where you will still get the correct results. I might, for example, instead of checking for greater than, I might check for less than. It is possible to write these conditions in a variety of ways. What is important is to ensure that what you require at the end is obtained through the instructions that you have given. Repetitive actions. 
we looked at the for loop last time and i had explained the for loop here let me go over to the blank page and again try to do the same thing here there is a block of statements which i want to execute again and again and again five times six times n times where n is some given value the way i would like to set up an iteration is that since i want to execute it once twice thrice four times n times i have to do some counting so i will use an artificial variable called i i will set i equal to 1 initially and in the condition i will keep examining whether i is less than equal to n if it is less than or equal to n that means i want to execute that body of statements iteratively so i will come out here execute that block and then increment the value of i by 1 so it's like count one so initially i start with one execute this block once then i increment i i will become two i will not go further i will go back now to this point i will not go back here mind you because i will be reset to one and that will become a perpetual loop so i'll go back here again examine is i greater than n let's say n is equal to 5 so first time i will be one then after executing this once i will become two with two i go here is 2 less than equal to 5 answer is yes i will go down again and execute this block second time i will become 3 again i will continue when i is 5 5 is still less than or equal to 5 assuming n is equal to 5 i will still execute this the fifth time now i will become 6 6 is not less than equal to 5 so i will come out so this will iterate as many times as i want we had seen the specification of for loop instruction to c++ in the most general form this particular thing is called initialization so i can initialize a counter i can do a whole lot of other initializations if i want this is called condition test and this is the increment that is post execution of a block it is shown as increment here but again i can take any complicated expression evaluation and assignment here so this is post execution or preparation for next iterations i will just call it increment which is to be understood to mean that any preparation for the next iteration so i might want to execute multiple statements or something generally an increment kind of operation is implied in the for instruction that we shall see if i want to do something else for the next iteration then obviously i will have to attach it to this block itself so within this block after doing whatever computations i want to do iteratively i might write additional statements which will prepare my algorithm for the next is iteration we shall see that example here. and the for statement that we had seen actually encompasses all of this this whole thing is regarded as one block by cp plea dumbo so this is far superior to mere conditional execution here also there is a conditional execution but this is conditional iterative execution keep on repeating some we saw an example of this last time we shall see one more example of computing factorial n so here is an example i have defined n factorial to be an integer variable i have defined n as integer variable and i have defined i as integer variable so let us look at this i am going to use three variables n i and n factorial n is the number whose factorial i wish to calculate could be 5 6 10 20 whatever i is going to be the kind of count that i explained and n factorial is going to be the final value the way i proceed is i initialize n factorial to a value 1 after all factorial of 1 is 1 so i assume this is the first term now every time i execute an iterative body look at this executive execution of iterative body or the specification for i equal to 1 i less than equal to n i plus plus so this is the first statement i equal to 1 this is called the initialization of the loop and that will be executed only once at the beginning by dumbo next 
the condition will be checked is i less than equal to n if the condition is true cpp will go into the block and will execute whatever instruction i have given this instruction says take the existing value of factorial multiply it by 1 and that becomes the resultant value initially with i equal to 1 it will multiply 1 by 1 only when i becomes 2 it will multiply 1 by 2 and get the value 2 in the next iteration the value will be 2 which will be multiplied by 3 and so on till i becomes not less than or equal to n at which time it will get out and then it will execute this c out statement where factorial n is n factorial so it will output the values of these two variables interspersed with these two strings so that i get a meaningful statement is this clear to everybody how this is executed so this is the crux of any iterative execution last time what we had seen was very complicated example of what can this part be what can this part be and what can this part be please remember in one of the slides we have said www xxx yyy something like that. so this could be any complex statement assignment initialization this could again be any complex expression at the end it must result in true or false and there could be multiple statements separated from each other that is possible etc the complete program will of course start with include io stream using namespace std int main and then int n factorial n and i notice that i use a output statement first to let the dumbo tell me that it is expecting a value of n so give value of n and end l notice that instead of backslash n i have written end l which is a standard name which dumbo knows provided we have told him use namespace std and then i get the value of n this is followed by by my iteration setup i start with n factorial equal to 1 for i equal to 1 up to i as long as i is less than equal to n in steps of 1 notice the use of i plus plus i could have also written i is equal to i plus 1 both mean the same thing so please note that this is a full fledged expression and reassignment so it will actually change the value of i by 1 this is exactly same as i equal to i plus 1 and then i calculate n factorial as equal to n factorial multiplied by i and at the end of the iteration i do this notice that this is the only way to specify calculation of an iterative body where the number of iterations are not known in advance if i knew i was calculating factorial of 5 i could have even written a single expression n factorial is equal to 5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 and i would have got the factor the reason i am writing a program is i don't know which value it is whose factorial i want to compute since that is a variable i have to set up an iteration so that is the purpose of iteration is an extremely powerful programming mechanism available to us cut c c++ dumbo we we'll look at another iterative problem i mentioned hemchandra's problem hemchandra lived in 12th century ad in india and he was concerned with actually building a meter for musical beats but translated in more simple ways suppose i have to build a wall of length 8 8 feet and i have bricks which are either 2 feet long or 1 foot long so i have only two types of brick some 1 foot long some 2 feet long the question is in how many ways can i lay the bricks so that i fill the 8 feet in how many different ways i can have bricks arrange such that i fill up the complete 8 feet here are some examples i could for example use four b- uh, bricks of 2 feet each i could use all bricks of 1 foot each then i will require eight i may use three bricks of 2 feet and two bricks of 1 feet i may use uh, two bricks of 2 feet each and four bricks of 1 foot so these are the multiple ways how many different ways exist that is the question the actual question which hemchandra tried to answer was to design a poetic meter with 8 bits suppose i want to design a poetic meter with 8 bits and the meter is made of short syllables and long syllables exactly like 1 foot long brick or 2 feet long brick short and long short syllabus is 1 bit long syllabus is 2 bits this is the standard musical beat pattern how many ways are there of filling in 8 bits Here is an example of a poetic meter. Some of you would recognize 
या कुंदेंदु तुषार हार दावला सो दिस इज़ द रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ़ अ लॉन्ग बीट शॉट लॉन्ग 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 शॉट शॉट लॉन्ग शॉट एट्सेट्रा एट्सेट्रा इफ़ आई हैव एन एट बीट मीटर हाउ मेनी वेज आई कैन हैव क्लासिकल सो हिमचंद्र सेज इन हिज राइट अप रिटर्न इन ट्वेल्थ सेंचुरी दैट बाय द मेथड ऑफ पिंगला इट इज इनफ टू ऑब्जर्व दैट द लास्ट बीट इज लॉन्ग और शॉर्ट बेस्ड ऑन दैट आई कैन कंप्यूट हाउ मेनी डिफरेंट क्लासेस कैन बी देयर this was a wonderful observation and this resulted in his solution to this problem which we shall see in a moment incidentally pingala was a mathematician poet from 500 ad so he lived 1500 years before hemchandra and yet hemchandra is giving credit to pingala this is just a short unsolicited advice to all of you You are most welcome to copy things because that is how we learn fast. Somebody has already discovered something, but copy only if necessary and only if permitted, and always give credit. The last part we often forget. Here is the Hemchandra solution. I will not go through the details. I will straight away go to the derivation. Those of you who are interested in musical beat classification and the Hemchandra solution can mull over this slide later. But effectively, what Hemchandra says. is that if i call s as the class of 8 bit patterns with short last beat and l as class of 8 bit patterns with long last beat then effectively l plus s will give me the total number of variations however he defines how he can calculate that part one particular class by using the previous number of classes with less number of bits effectively he says that 8 bit patterns will be equal to All seven-bit patterns plus six-bit patterns, and he says by this you can calculate the total number of classes. So this is called a recursive definition. I am defining the total number of eight-bit patterns in terms of number of seven-bit patterns, uh, uh, seven-bit uh, 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 patterns, and six-bit patterns. How do I define six-bit pattern in terms of five-bit patterns and four-bit patterns? How do I define a five-bit pattern, four-bit pattern, and three-bit pattern? can you not see that this would be a very classical simple case of applying iteration albeit with some meaningful construction of the statements algebraically if hn is the number of patterns with n beats then what hemchandra is saying is h8 will be equal to h7 plus h6 in general hn will be equal to hn minus 1 plus hn minus 2 does this help us to compute h8 well yes if i know h7 and h6 how do i know h7 i can know h7 if i know h6 and h5 how do i know h6 same h5 and h4 etc but there is an end to it because ultimately i'll end up with h1 h2 which can be actually computed absolutely i don't need anything else and therefore if we know all these successively we can build up to h8 or for that matter h10 h25 whatever we need so if h1 is the number of patterns with one bit obviously there can be only one way either short bit or long bit there is only one one class okay h2 number with two bits there are two so either i can have short and short or long remember if i have to construct two feet then either one and one or two i can't have any other combination once i know h1 and h2 i know h3 is h2 plus h1 which is 3 I know H4 is H3 plus H2, which is 5. I know H5, which is H4 plus H3, which is 8, and so on. Consequently, I get H8 as equal to 34. That is the answer obtained by Hemchandra using Pingala's method. This is the program to compute H8. We can now instruct our Dumbo C++ to calculate H8 for us given n. So I define in 10, then I give a value of n. which number to compute but notice that the iteration is this time more complicated i have to add two previous terms to get the next term so i start arbitrarily by saying that my previous term is 1 current term is 2 if previous term is 1 and current term is 2 then i can set up an iteration for i equal to 3 to n where i calculate the h next term by adding previous term and current what will happen for the first time when i execute this iteration h priv is 1 and h current is 2 so 1 plus 2 i will get 3 as h next so i calculated h3 correctly but 
I want to set up my calculation mechanism for the next iteration. In the next iteration, whatever is the next term must become the current term and whatever is the current term must become the previous term. Notice the sequence. When I say H priv is equal to H current, since H current was 2, H priv will now become 2. And then when I say H current equal to H next, H next which was 3 will become H current. Notice that if I reverse the order of these two statements, I will get completely wrong results. I must first preserve the value of H current into a variable and then only change H current to H next. So consequently, in the very first iteration, H next will be calculated as 3 and it will now become H current and H pre will become 2. When I go out to the next iteration because of this I++, plus plus, I++ plus plus will become 4, I will become 4, it is still suppose less than N, then I will again calculate. H next will now be 3 plus 2 which is 5. And again the reassignment of H previous and H current will happen and I will keep on executing. Are you clear about this iteration? When I complete this iteration, at the end, whatever is the value of H next will be the value of Hn or for the nth term. The code is a bit tricky, so you need a command. For example, you may say at the beginning of an iteration, H current is Hi minus 1, write ith term if you can't put this subscript and so on in a computer program, H prev is Hi minus 2 where i is the value of variable i. Can you prove this? Well, using mathematical induction, you can prove that. Basically, proving h next is equal to h prev plus h current is adequate, so correct answer will be generated. There is a proof by induction, which I am ignoring. You can all go through the, all of you are familiar with proof by induction? Good. So you can figure this out. What is important here is that mathematics is being generated by from poetry. This series is very interesting. It represents number of petals in many flowers. Most important, the ratio of consecutive terms tends to a limit. You might have heard of golden ratio, for example. These numbers are more commonly known as Fibonacci numbers. You are familiar with Fibonacci numbers? Yes. Hemchandra lived much before Fibonacci. Having calculated Fibonacci numbers, we now apply the iteration technique to some more complex numerical problem. Suppose we want to find out the root of a given function, fx. So for example, I want to find out what is the value of x such that fx is equal to 0. All of you are familiar with this notion of the root of a function, root of an equation, fine. Now the newton raphson method actually works on being able to calculate the first derivative of fx, f dash x. So if fx and f dash x can be easily calculated and if a good initial guess is available for the root, then I can do successive computations such that I will converge to the final root. We shall see an example of that. For example, if I want to find out the square root of some k, what is the function now for square root? fx is equal to x square minus k. This is the generic function. f dash x is 2x, the derivative. So fx and f dash x can be calculated easily. They do not require more than two or three arithmetic operations. What could be the initial value? Well, initial guess x not equal to 1 always works. So we start with an assumption that root is x equal to 1. We don't know what the actual root is. But we will be able to find out if we start with x equal to 1. But what is the iterative mechanism that we can set up? We are not very clear about that. We know fx is given. We know f dash x can be calculated. We know, sort of, we assume that x0 equal to 1 should be good enough as an initial guess. But what should be the next guess? What should be the next guess? And so on. How to get better xi plus 1 given xi? Here is a curve, fx. In this curve, I have started with some xi. Initial guess, I call it. Given xi, I want to find out what should be the next xi plus 1 so that I iteratively go nearer to the root. Where is the root of this equation, by the way? It is here, right? Wherever the function crosses x equal to 0, okay, when fx is equal to 0 at that point, that is the root of the equation. So I want to reach here. 
I do not know exactly how this function looks like and where exactly it will cross x axis, but I am starting with some x r. So, what I do? I say point A, which is this x i comma 0 is known. This is my point A. Now, I calculate f of x i. What is f of x i at this point? It is given by this function. So, this will be point B whose coordinates will be x i and f of x i because f of x i will be the y axis. So, this is my point B. Now, I have reached here. I want to go nearer this point by the way. So, I, have, I now come up with an extremely interesting hypothesis that if I draw a tangent to this curve at this point B, then wherever that tangent crosses my x axis should be a closer point to the root. Now, what is the tangent at this point B? So, I approximate this function by the tangent and calculate the intercept of that tangent on the x axis. Here is the tangent and the tangent crosses the x axis at some point which I call x i plus 1. You will agree that this x i plus 1 is a better guess to the root than what I started with namely x i. I call this point C. What are the coordinates of point C? Point C is x i plus 1 comma 0. But what is x i plus 1? Because the point B is x i comma f x i, from that can I calculate the coordinates of point C or the new x i plus 1? Here is the calculation. f dash x, which is the derivative, but this time I am saying a b upon a c. So, this is a b and this is a c. a b upon a c is nothing but f of x i divided by x i minus x i plus 1. So, what I am doing? I am calculating the slope of this tangent line and this works out to be f of x i upon x i minus x i plus 1 or this is equal to x i plus 1. Consequently, this is equal to x i minus f of x i divided by f dash of x i. The simple mathematical manipulation of this equation permits me to calculate x i plus 1 if I know x i. So, consequently, if I start with x i, then whatever is the value of x i I have chosen, I can calculate the next value for iteration by using this formula. We are of course assuming that f x and f dash x both are calculable for any given value of x. With that assumption, this value can be calculated and this becomes x i plus 1. And once I come to x i plus 1, I can repeat this process. I can now find out what is the value of the function at x i plus 1. It will be somewhere here. I will draw another tangent at that point. You will agree that it will intercept the x axis closer to the root. Again, I can repeat this process till such time that there is no improvement between successive x i. They become so close that that itself is my root. Presto, we have got an iterative method to solve the roots of an equation using this method which is called newton raphson technique. This is a numerical computational technique to get the roots. So, to calculate square root of k, let us say, I say x i plus 1 is x i minus f x i upon f dash x i. Since f x is equal to x square minus k, f dash x is 2 x, then I know that given x i, I can calculate x i plus 1 as x i minus x square minus k divided by 2 x i, which is same as x i plus k upon x i divided by 2. You can do this simplification yourself. Effectively, you have to use the same formula. The crux of the computational instruction to Dumbo, however, is in the fact that given an initial guess, I have a method to compute the next guess. Given that guess, I have the same method to compute the next guess and so on. And I have the comfort that these successive guesses will move closer to the approximation of my root till I ultimately land up with that root. So, if I start with x 0 equal to 1, then I can compute x 1, then x 2, etc., etc., and we can get as close to square root k as required. We are not proving this, we leave it to uh, other courses in maths and so on, but computationally, there could be another way. 
here is one way i am given k i define xi and k as floating point variables please note that i must deal with floating point numbers i input the value of k now i set up xi equal to 1 the initial case inside that i write xi square minus k greater than 0.001 or k minus xi square is greater than 0.001 notice that i might approach this from either the positive side or negative side until error in the square root is at most 0.001 so i am now not counting the number of iterations i am saying i don't care how many iterations i have to take but take me as close as possible to the root which means the difference between two successive values should be as minimal as possible that difference between successive values i call as error and that is my error computation and then i put xi as xi upon k divided by xi by 2 notice that this is the next term i am reassigning the value to xi for the next iteration so xi changes consequently the condition will change and this simple iteration without any other computation will get me the final root this is another method yet another way i start with xi equal to 1 and i say while xi minus k greater than 0.001 or k minus xi square is greater than 0.001 do this computation and i say c out less than x notice an alternate way of asking dumbo to iterate we have seen only for loop for something something till some condition is made and with this increment that is the format of for loop but here there is no counting increment that i want i simply want to reach as close to the root as possible i can then use another variant of iterative instructions to dumbo called while this condition is while this condition remains or is satisfied keep on doing the body the body has only one statement after this again it will check the condition if the condition is still true again execute again execute again execute till such time that the margin between the two successive values is less than 0.001 after which you will just output value of it so you can see many different ways of elegant programming are possible it is up to us to imagine when to use while when to use for when to use something else etc etc this is the while statement the while statement has the format while condition loop through the body so the way the action takes place check condition then execute loop body if it is true and repeat so if loop body is a single statement then we need not use braces but generally it's a good idea to use opening brace and closing brace because in this particular case you have only one statement to execute in the body but in general you could have three four five statement like for example if you were to write the hemchandra numbers or fibonacci series calculation then you have to prepare for the next iteration by reassigning h pre when h current so you'll have two statements they are best enclosed in a body like this so you could actually translate the for statement into a while statement by writing appropriate please write down for a given for loop how will you implement using while and you will be able to understand this let me write down the flow chart for your benefit so this is how the while condition will look like the statement that i shall make so this is the while block and the way i will write it is to say while
as simple as that. While condition, execute block. So what is the entire block? As many statements as you want. You will notice that if before the file, you put an initialization statement such as i equal to 1, and then in the while, you say while i less than equal to n. And after the block, within the block, you write i equal to i plus 1. You will automatically get an iteration which is prescribed using the for statement. For i equal to 1 till i is less than equal to n in the increment of i plus 1. So both are actually equivalent. When should you use while statement? When should you use for statement? Depends. If there is a control variable with some initial value, and an update rule, and whose value distinctly defines each loop iteration, use for. So this is a thumb rule. If you have to prescribe an iteration in which there is a control variable or a counting variable, then the best thing is to use for, where count is initialized, count is checked against some condition, and the value of count is used inside the iteration. If the loop executes a fixed number of time, Again, you can use for, for i equal to 1 to n. But if the loop has to execute till a certain condition is satisfied, then you can use y. It's a matter of choice, matter of test. Is this, is this clear? Okay. There will be lab assignments based on these numerical computations. So let me describe very briefly the kind of labs that you are going to have now. First, there is homework. Write a program to calculate the cube root using newton raphson method. The cube is more interesting. And check how many iterations are needed to get good answers. Should be actually very few. Uh, there are some of you incidentally who claim to have done a whole lot of programming earlier. So I have a special problem for those people. That is about the bus ticket problem. You remember, you have to calculate the bus ticket for an elder or for an adult or for a child. We assume that the input is age. For all those who know programming, here is a challenge. The input is given as date of birth. And you know what is the date today. Using that, do appropriate date arithmetic to find out whether somebody is more than 60 years, somebody is more than 12 years or not. So your input is today's date written in the conventional form, that is 10th August 2009. Now, if it is August, you might have a problem. So, here is the challenge. We shall assume that the date of birth is written as 10, uh, what is it? Is 8th month or 9th month, August? 8. So I'm giving you an integer number as the date of birth. 10082009. The first two digits will mean date, the next two digits will mean month, and the last four digits will mean year. So this is this is today's date, of course. I don't know what rule will apply if the date of birth is same. One day old child, they still charge money, I think. I don't know. But anyway, so let's say date of birth is some 28 December, let's say 2001. This could be 1948 or whatever. Please note the complex problem if you have an input of this kind. The complex problem is you cannot subtract one date from another to get the age. There is a lot of complex arithmetic has to be done. We shall see later how C++ Dumbo helps us using variety of library routines to do this date computation easily. But since there are some of you who claim to have done a lot of programming, this would be an interesting challenge for you. Of course, this is not part of the lab. As far as the lab is concerned, you continue to do a rather simpler exercise. OK. In the concluding two slides, I'm going to describe, first, the way we will approach the evaluation as you would have understood by now, I do not really associate too much importance to marks and grades. However, they are real life issues and all of you have to contend for good grades. And I have to do some evaluation. I try to put in every evaluation 
sufficient learning so that every test or phase is also a learning experience because I think that is our job together to learn as much as we can. But we have to get marks and we have to get a grade. So here is how I propose to grade the students. Out of a total of 100% weightage for the marks in this course, I propose to associate 10% marks to the quizzes. We have had some sample quizzes earlier, but we shall have in the third week of August or maybe fourth week of August, a quiz which will be a regular 20 or 25 minute quiz in one of the lectures. That will be a formal quiz with multiple questions and that quiz will amount to about five marks. The remaining five marks post mid semester, we shall have multiple quizzes in every lecture. You will wonder how I will conduct multiple quizzes in every lecture without wasting time. We, you shall see the fun. I am actually getting a gadget designed for you. And I am actually making about 1,000 of those. So I will issue one to each one of you. Like that Kaun Banega Karodpati gadget if you have seen. So I will flash a quiz and I will ask you to press A, B, C or D. And I will collect your answer and give you marks. These gadgets actually are available but the uh, Firangis who make these gadgets offered me one at 2,500 rupees each and I did not have that kind of money. So I actually got it designed in the last two months, got it fabricated and tested and now we have to test what happens when 1,000 of these gadgets work. They are costing me only 700 rupees. So we shall, we shall, we shall use those here. Then we will have assignments. These assignments will typically be given in the labs. So with every lab there will be an assignment announced. You ordinarily, you are supposed to submit and upload your assignment in the same lab that you conduct Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. However, we might consider giving extra time for loading in case you have satisfactorily conveyed to your TA that you have actually completed that assignment. You have a handwritten copy or something, but you just want to polish it or whatever to submit it later. So all the assignments that you will do in the laboratories, which you will be submitting on the Moodle, will constitute a 10% of weightage. You shall all be doing a course project. That is the most exciting part of the course in my opinion. I am introducing group projects where you will have to make groups of anywhere between three to five students together who will actually solve a larger and more challenging problem through programming. This is not an easy task because I wish you to learn how teams of programmers collaborate with each other to come out with some meaningful software which is substantially large piece of software. It is not uncommon when I used to conduct such projects earlier, it is not uncommon to have anywhere between 2,000 to 5,000 lines of working code written by students. Naturally, this group project will extend over a long period of time. The group projects will be announced just before the mid same and they will continue till end same. But you will have to form the groups ahead of time. These groups must be from your same lab group. So now that you know your lab colleagues, start identifying the people in the group. Naturally, you would like to uh, avoid sleeping partners. So be careful that you choose the right groups. It will have as much as 30% weightage. The evaluation of the group project itself is slightly complex. I shall explain it to you when time comes. The mid-same exam will be 20% and end-same exam will be 30% weightage. Minimum passing grade, I have fixed at 40%. That means any student who gets 40% marks or more will not fail. That is guaranteed. I hate failing people. There is another reason why you might fail. In the assignments or quizzes or exams, where copying or using anybody's help is explicitly prohibited, anybody found indulging into these activities will be immediately awarded an F grade and there shall be no discussion thereof. That is one thing I hate. So if there is a home assignment which you are supposed to do on your own, not for a single second you must discuss that with anybody. You must submit that assignment yourself. I don't mind a blank paper submitted. I value it far more than any quick copying from anybody. Because the purpose here is that you learn, each one of you learn. So this is something I have tremendous allergy to. And if, in spite of, so in spite of these strong warnings, I had in the previous occasions 20 years ago, every year I had to fail one or two students because I could catch them copying. It is very unfortunate, I feel very bad, just like those who fail, but I guarantee this, anybody indulging in any unfair means in this course throughout, 
will definitely get an F grade immediately upon detection of that unfair means. So please avoid that. Keep that farthest from your mind. The purpose here is to learn. And I think there are enough marks and grades available without doing any such nonsense. Is that okay? Fine. Thank you. Thank you.